Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. The education industry donating millions of dollars ahead of the midterms, mostly to Democrats. Candidates who got the most support in 2020 backed student debt cancellation. We tell you what this means. Young people are looking for alternatives to college over concerns of high cost and student debt. Some are choosing to learn a trade. President Biden campaigning for Democrats ahead of the midterms. He kicked off his Building a Better America tour yesterday, but not without some hiccups. A huge amount of fentanyl was intercepted in a week at just one border port in Arizona. Some of it was hidden in trucks, crutches, and even the human body. The families of U.S. troops gathered for a military ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery today. It's been one year since an explosion in Kabul killed their loved ones. U.S. troops escorted the families to lay wreaths at the tomb of the unknown soldier. They honored their loved ones with a moment of silence and taps. Thirteen U.S. service members and at least 170 Afghans were killed on August 26 last year. An Islamic State bomber blew himself up at an airport gate while the troops were evacuating Americans and at-risk Afghans before the complete U.S. military withdrawal from the country. And now on to President Biden's plan to cancel student debt. Some Republicans are questioning whether it's related to, one, the midterms, and two, getting more support for Democrat candidates. But Democrats who plan to back... Democrats who back Biden's plan say it's about helping student loan borrowers and holding universities accountable. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Ahead of the midterms, the education industry is donating the most to Democrats, according to the nonprofit Open Secrets. It tracks money in politics. Back in 2020, the education industry set new donation records, pouring over $340 million into campaigns. Nearly 90 percent of it went to Democrats. The candidate who got the most? Joe Biden. He received more than $64.5 million from the industry. Next in line were Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Both have encouraged Biden to cancel student debt. He's going to change the income-determined repayment plan so that nobody has to go through debt hell to try to get an education. But the third part is absolutely about holding colleges and universities accountable. But Republican Congresswoman Virginia Fox told NTD's Capitol Report this week she thinks Biden's move is related to the midterms. The Democrats are trying to buy votes by doing this this fall. Uh, They've put off and put off and put off having people continue to pay the debt they legally owe. And it is irresponsible on their part. Biden plans to cancel up to $20,000 of federal student loan debt for anyone below an income cap. Estimates say it'll cost between $300 to $600 billion. The National Taxpayers Union Foundation estimates it'll cost the average U.S. taxpayer more than $2,000. It's going to be about $24 billion per year. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, that $24 billion a year, that is about 3% of what we spend on the military. That's just a tiny, tiny fraction. The official cost will depend on how many Americans take advantage of the plan. The White House hasn't said whether tax increases are necessary. Officials argue that the national deficit is already plunging under Biden and that'll offset the cost. Biden's debt forgiveness plan is not set in stone. It's likely to face lawsuits, and it's unclear if it'll hold up in court. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. And speaking of the Biden administration's plan to cancel some student debt for millions of Americans, while college graduates may get some measure of financial help, students who recently graduated from high school say they're opting to skip college in favor of a career in the trades. It's part of a trend showing undergraduate enrollment rates have dropped below pre-pandemic highs at some colleges. Here's that story. Faced with the rising cost of higher education, a hot jobs market, and a volatile economy, these high school graduates are entering the job market right now. Student debts are crazy right now. They're through the roof when it comes to having to pay back the interest and everything. So they say they're skipping college, at least for now. If I go into the trades, I can make money while I learn and then eventually maybe go to college after after I make enough money. Experts say it's part of a pattern showing undergraduate college enrollment down last spring since the start of the pandemic. 
We really thought things that sh things would be starting to pick up a little at this point, or at least the rate of decline would be slowing now after two full years of the pandemic. A recent study by the National Student Clearinghouse found 662,000 fewer students enrolled in undergraduate programs in spring of 2022. As of late May, the undergraduate student body had dropped by nearly 1.4 million students from the start of the pandemic. The economy really changed. Uh, starting last summer, wages were rising, employers were eager to hire people even with minimal skills or training. Tuition is still very high and uh, students have a lot of concerns uh, and fears about taking on student debt. Here at the National Leadership and Skills Conference in Atlanta, thousands of students compete to showcase their trade skills. Maybe you decide, hey, automotive's not for me, I want to see culinary. Or maybe you decide, you know, neither of those options are for me, I want to check out jet engines. Increased interest in trades is good news here in Virginia at ACTE headquarters. The group represents thousands of career and technical education professionals. Our career and technical education programs in many cases pay very well, um, very competitive with those that may have a four-year degree. Back on the competition floor, students prepare for the world beyond high school, college degree or not. President Biden is campaigning for Democrats ahead of the midterm elections. He attended two events Thursday telling people to vote Democrat to save the planet and the U.S. democracy. Good to see you all. President Biden on Thursday addressed a crowd of thousands at a high school in Maryland. He said women's right to get an abortion is on the ballot this year, among other things. The safety of your kids from gun violence is on the ballot. And it's not hyperbole. The very survival of our planet is on the ballot. Just months ago, Biden's poll numbers went down as inflation soared and his agenda stalled. But Democrat voters showed more support for the president after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. In his speech, Biden pointed out the things his party has accomplished so far, which, according to Democrats, are big achievements. I just signed into law the Historic Inflation Reduction Act. We just passed the first significant gun safety legislation in 30 years in this country. Biden also outlined what's still on his agenda. He said he'll ban assault weapons and protect Social Security and Medicare, among other things. Biden also expanded on his effort to paint Republicans as the ultra-MAGA party, saying he doesn't respect MAGA Republicans. The MAGA Republicans don't just threaten our personal rights and economic security. They're a threat to our very democracy. They refuse to accept the will of the people. They embrace, embrace political violence. They don't believe in democracy. He went on to say that MAGA ideology is like semi-fascism and called on mainstream Republicans to vote Democrat. One man interrupted the president's speech, yelling that Biden stole the election. The man was then escorted out of the room. The White House said Thursday's event was the first stop in Biden's Building a Better America tour. And now on to NASA. The space agency will be launching its Artemis I moon rocket on August 29th. This takes the country one step closer towards completing former President Trump's goals for U.S. space exploration. The unmanned spacecraft will be launched into space from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida August 29th. It will be a high-stakes test flight. If all goes well, NASA could be sending astronauts to the moon again as soon as 2024. The Orion capsule on Artemis 1 is going to be leaving Earth. It's going to uh, go to the moon and circle, use the gravitational pull of the moon and circle out into space. At that point in space would be the deepest, farthest that any human rated vehicle has ever been in space. And then it's going to come back and splash down on Earth. And then Artemis 2 is going to have two astronauts on, on the Orion capsule. If everything goes according to plan, Artemis 1 will reach return speeds of up to 25,000 miles per hour and splash down off the coast of San Diego, California on October 10th. There's liquid hydrogen uh, and liquid oxygen. That it's both cryogenics. When they come into the main combustion chamber, they immediately go to plus 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit and they come out at Mach 13, 13 times the speed of sound as the exhaust. That is, would take you from New York City to L.A. in less than 15 minutes. It has been almost 50 years since the last manned mission to the moon. Astronomical costs and a lack of political support hampered further deep space travel. 
On this new mission, NASA will test how safe the Orion spacecraft is and how well the Space Launch System rocket works. As you heard, uh, we, we fly like we test and test like we fly, and that's the, that's the NASA uh, uh, way of doing business because we're putting humans, we're putting astronauts on these engines. We want it to work right every time, and we want them to be able to do their job in the space, get into space safely, and we want them to bring them home to their families. Former President Trump signed a directive to NASA in 2017. He specified that he wanted astronauts back on the moon and refocus America's space program on human exploration. The price tag for this single mission exceeds $4 billion. SpaceX founder Elon Musk, together with the head of T-Mobile, have announced they are teaming up to improve cell phone coverage with satellite technology. The thing that I think is really profound about what we're announcing today is that it will save lives. Um, and we will no longer read about these tragedies that, that happen where people get lost, and, and if only they could have called for help, they'd be okay. My vision for this is that on our most popular plans, we're just going to go ahead and include this. And, you know, we feel like that's what the uncarrier does, that's important. Now, there, there, there may be low-cost plans that don't include it, and there our aspiration is to charge a monthly service fee that will be far less than the monthly service fees charged by today's sa satellite connectivity services. Yeah, I think an important thing, though, is that you will not uh, need to get a new phone. The phone you currently have will work. SpaceX and T-Mobile want to do away with dead zones for cell service. They want to team up to cover remote areas with wireless connectivity. Musk says the service will rely on SpaceX Starlink satellites currently used in lab facilities. He says even in a natural disaster where an entire region or country lost connectivity, your phone would still work. The service is supposed to be able to work with most of the phones on the market today. The satellites will use T-Mobile's mid-band spectrum to create a new network. It will start with texting services in a phase that will begin by the end of next year. Musk said his company's next-generation satellites will have larger antennas that will connect directly to mobile phones on the T-Mobile network. On the topic of being connected, high-speed internet is coming to two Native American tribes in California. The Department of J Commerce just awarded them a $127 million grant. The Yurok and Hoopa tribes will each receive the money. It will provide high-speed internet connections to approximately 2,000 homes, businesses, and other institutions like schools, hospitals, and government buildings. The project calls for constructing a fiber optic cable as well as fixing wireless internet. It's expected to create about 200 local jobs over a two-year period. And still to come, starting a new school year in a new country and speaking a new language. That's what many Ukrainian children who've come to the U.S. have to prepare for. And driving can be particularly challenging for those with autism, so a program at the University of Michigan is studying why. The goal is to help autistic youth improve their skills on the road. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. Customs and Border Protection seized over 1.2 million fentanyl pills and other drugs in this past week alone. The drugs were hidden inside trucks, crutches, and a woman's body. A number comes from officials at the Nogales port of entry about an hour south of Tucson. On Wednesday, border agents intercepted around 16,000 fentanyl pills and other illicit drugs hidden in a truck heading for the United States. The day before, agents found around 14,000 fentanyl pills hidden inside crutches that were being used by a pedestrian. And on Monday, agents seized around 2,000 fentanyl pills hidden in and near a woman's body. The largest number of illicit drugs seized was on Saturday when agents inspected an 18-wheeler truck and found around 1.27 million fentanyl pills and over 100 pounds of cocaine, plus more drugs hidden in various parts of the vehicle. And now on to an espionage case. A former U.S. Navy engineer and his wife are accused of trying to sell classified information to a foreign government. A federal judge just set their trial date for January 17th. The couple is accused of coordinating three separate drop-offs of SD cards with classified information about nuclear submarines. They were allegedly paid thousands of dollars in cryptocurrency. They believed it was going to a foreign government, but it was actually an FBI sting operation. The FBI arrested the pair at the fourth drop in October 2021. The couple originally pleaded guilty, but the judge rejected the offer last week, saying the suggested sentences didn't match the severity of the alleged crimes. 
They subsequently withdrew their guilty pleas and asked for a trial date. It's time to check your freezers. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has a new public health alert out. The USDA has issued an alert for Purdue's frozen, ready-to-eat chicken breast tenders labeled gluten-free. The agency says the product may contain small pieces of clear plastic and blue dye. The 42-ounce plastic bags of chicken tenders were produced on July 12th and have a best-if-used-by date of July 12th, 2023. They were shipped to BJ's Wholesale Clubs nationwide, and while the stores no longer sell them, some people could already have the product in their homes. There have been no reports of injuries. Still, the USDA says you should not eat the tenders. Instead, the bag should be thrown away or returned to the store. We have more health news for you. A total of 84 people are sick from E. coli in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. The CDC announced 47 more reported cases yesterday, doubling the previous number. 38 patients had to go to the hospital for treatment. The outbreak might be connected to some Wendy's restaurants. According to the CDC, 52 people reported eating sandwiches at Wendy's in the week before they got sick. The agency is looking into romaine lettuce on those sandwiches and is trying to figure out if that could be the source of the outbreak. In a statement, Wendy's said it's cooperating with the investigation and they're replacing the lettuce at some restaurants as a precaution. Turning our attention now to the effects of the Ukraine war, many Ukrainian refugees have settled in the U.S. since the war began, and many children are now preparing for a new school year in a brand new environment. Let's take a look. Thursday marked the first day of the 2022-23 school year for students at St. Nicholas Cathedral School in Chicago. Administrators say this year will be unlike any other at St. Nick's. This year we have 65 students from Ukraine and those students need support. Imagine coming from another country and you don't have those resources um, and, and the fear of like you don't speak the language. So that did fall on us. Those pressures fall on us. They just wanted some sort of like, something, some sort of comfort, right? And knowing that everything would be okay. Which, it, which for a lot of our families, you know, things aren't okay. A mother from Ukraine fled her homeland with her two children and arrived in Chicago last April. Her children are now students at St. Nick's. I heard about this school in the church. And when I came the first time, a principal of this school, Miss Cyrilli, was so kind and smile. And I understand, oh, those, those people fit to us because they are sincerely welcoming us. Students, staff and parents started the new school year off on a positive note with a special prayer. What do the Ukrainian children have to say about their new school? I like the teachers, I like the cafeteria, I like lots of things here. I had to come here because there, there were no school, there were uh, lots of air alarms and it's uncomfortable. About 50 of the new Ukrainian students spent the summer intensively learning English to prepare for the new academic year. The school principal says thanks to an outpouring of community support and donations, St. Nick's has been able to hire staff to help address language barriers with the new students. In other news, researchers at the University of Michigan are studying how autistic youth detect road hazards. The goal is to help the young motorists sharpen their driving skills. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. The project to study and help autistic drivers is funded by Ford Motor Company. During phase one of the study, students with autism didn't detect as many hazards as the control group during simulated drives, but some extra instruction helped. Here's lead researcher Elise Hodges. We were encouraged to find that the intervention worked for the kids in the ASD um, group. So those folks that underwent training improved in two thirds of the hazards in the simulated drive. Tate Elwood Molesky was diagnosed with autism at age three. He's among those who plan to get back in the driver's seat for phase two. So basically, um, it makes me nervous, but, uh, but I do want to be able to drive, especially when my parents are gone, and get places where I want to go. His mom, Debbie Molesky, helped get the program off the ground. She was concerned about her son not being able to drive, so she approached her boss at Ford one day in 2018 and asked if he would support a program to help autistic kids to learn how to drive. He enthusiastically agreed. The study revealed a couple of areas for improvement. We noticed that they had certain difficulties in common. Uh, One of them was staying in their lane 
and another was stopping distance. So they tended to wait until they were right up at the stop sign and then jammed on it. Hodges hopes the individualized driving sessions planned for the study's second phase help. She also hopes similar programs pop up elsewhere in Michigan and beyond. The second phase is expected to start in a month or so. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Tensions between FedEx and its third-party contractors could have a big impact on deliveries this holiday season. FedEx on Friday asked a federal judge in Tennessee to stop one of its largest delivery contractors from disparaging its business with, quote, false and misleading statements. The lawsuit was filed in the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee. It seeks injunctive relief and monetary damages from Spencer Patton. The delivery contractor has 225 FedEx ground routes in 10 states, mostly in the Midwest. Patton has been publicly speaking out against FedEx ground and urging the company to compensate delivery contractors better. He says up to 35 percent of them are at risk of financial failure. New York police officers can no longer gather and have casual conversations while at work. That's according to a revised order from the NYPD. The new rule tells officers they cannot, quote, congregate or engage in unnecessary conversation with other members of the service while on post unless it's necessary for police work. A City Hall spokesperson called such conversations a tactical problem and a possible risk for officers and the public. The order takes effect immediately. The president of the city's police union called it unnecessary and warned that officers are quitting in large number due to, quote, miserable working conditions and the low pay. Five people were hospitalized Thursday night after a roller coaster ride malfunctioned at Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson Township, New Jersey. Witnesses told local media the El Toro roller coaster jerked forward at the end of the ride when people were unloading. Several riders complained of back pain. Employees can be seen inspecting the tracks, but no word on what caused the ride to malfunction. The ride is currently closed. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And up next, we ask, what are American voters concerned about heading into the midterm elections? Data from a search engine indicates that China is near the forefront this month, with only jobs and taxes being a higher priority. And TikTok can track keystrokes even on outside websites when the user types in the browser embedded in the app. That's according to research from a former Google engineer. More on that after the break. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen. If you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers, cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American cars? We're great. Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. All right. I'm at the house. And, uh... I'm gonna head inside. Okay, come on. This door. I'm in the house. What do you see? Uh, Let me check the den. Uh, There's nothing in the den. Let me check the kitchen. Uh, There's no one downstairs, it looks like. Wait, what was that? I don't know. Let Let me head upstairs. Did you shut this bathroom door? No. Oh, sh- What? It's not here. What do you mean? The the gun's not here. What? Where is it? Oh, my God. What's going on? Cam! Oh, my God, what's going on? Cameron? Are you in there? Open the door! Cam! Please! Please! Open the door, Cameron! Come on, Cam.
welcome back. Midterm elections are on the way, and it looks like China is one of the key issues this fall. Search engine data reveals voters are trying to learn more. NTD's Tiffany Meyer with China in Focus has more. With U.S. midterm elections on the horizon, concerns over China's influence are rising. According to a midterm tracker, China became the third most searched topic across the U.S. early this month, adding it to a list of issues that could influence midterm voters. The new data marks China's highest ranking on this list since late May, when Axios first began tracking. Data also reveals that the top five districts searching for China were all in Pelosi's home state, California. Axios' analysis says the impact of Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan has caught national attention. But it may extend farther, too. The China threat appears to be a hot topic in political campaigns from the U.K. to Australia. Last month, Britain's two prime minister candidates, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, debated on TV over who's tougher on Beijing. Sunak said China represents the biggest long-term threat to Britain. Responding to Sunak, Beijing said the British politician should not make an issue out of China or hype the so-called China threat. The U.S. is upgrading its missile defense system on the island of Guam, a U.S. territory and strategic axis in the Indo-Pacific region. Here's more. The U.S. is stepping up its missile defense system in Guam. Experts say the massive upgrade will counter Chinese aggression and help protect Taiwan from a potential Beijing invasion. The head of the U.S. Missile Defense Agency, John Hill, recently shared a progress update. Hill said Taiwan is facing what he called an evolved threat. That's because of China's advanced ballistic and cruise missiles, new hypersonic weapons, and even potential threats from space. He noted those weapons could strike at the same time from multiple directions and points of origin. Hill also touched on the coming fiscal year's presidential budget. In it, he said there's a portion for the Missile Defense Agency set aside for ballistic and hypersonic missile defense capability. That's on top of the portion for Army's cruise missile defenses. Hill said the great thing is that both systems have crossover in what they do. Guam is home to critical air and naval facilities. It could be a major target in the case of an Indo-Pacific war. Voice of America cited a researcher saying Guam would serve as a logistical hub. That's because it's close enough to expected conflict locations, but also far enough to stay out of certain Chinese weapons range. Senator Marsha Blackburn meets with Taiwan's president. She is in Taiwan for a three-day trip to show support for the island amid threats from Beijing. Blackburn arrived in Taiwan's capital on board a U.S. military aircraft Thursday evening. She's also due to meet Taiwan's top security official and Taiwan's foreign minister. She continues a series of recent trips by U.S. lawmakers to Taiwan. She also visited the Solomon Islands, Fiji, and Papua New Guinea. Blackburn told Fox News that she's been planning the trip for the past few months. The lawmaker says that she wants Pacific Island communities to know they have U.S. support. On top of that, she mentioned that it's important for more U.S. lawmakers to visit the Pacific region. That's so they can help relieve the pressure put on the region by the Chinese Communist regime. Beijing claims Taiwan as its territory in spite of never having ruled the island. The Chinese regime launched military drills near Taiwan after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited in early August. On a row of greenhouses outside Taiwan's capital of Taipei, a vanilla bean farmer is overseeing the installation of dozens of solar panels. It's part of a renewable development plan that could help the island resolve its energy needs without sacrificing its scarce farmland. Sang Tian Fu's farm currently exports most of its crop to Japan, but he's expanding to meet growing demand elsewhere. The government's support for solar energy has given Sang an opportunity. The use of solar panels has become an increasingly popular option for regions where land is at a premium. Taiwan provides generous subsidies for rooftop panels, and the government is also obliged to buy the surplus electricity they produce. It takes a long time to grow vanilla before there are any crops, but we can sell electricity from solar panels to the government for 20 years as soon as they are installed and have an income from that. In other words, once the solar panels are finished, I immediately have income. So especially for plants like vanilla that take three years before there are any crops, I think solar panels are a very good combination. The densely populated island's agricultural land makes up a fifth of its total area, so there is little room for sprawling wind and solar farms. 
Land shortages are one of the biggest obstacles to renewable energy development. They're estimated to require around 10 times more land per unit of power than conventional power sources. There are not a lot of big-scale solar energy installations because Taiwan has no desert and Taiwan's use of land is very dense. So while we are developing green energies, from the country's perspective, we are more likely to plan solar energy facilities that don't interfere with production. It's the same for the agricultural sector. Governments across the world have been trying to figure out how to minimize disruptions, avoid conflicts with farmers, and prevent further agricultural and biodiversity losses. In the U.S., dozens of wind and solar projects have been blocked amid concerns about the occupation of farmland. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. The popular app TikTok continues to be a security concern. The app could be tracking user keystrokes when they visit outside websites on the embedded browser. NTD's Tiffany Meyer with China in Focus has more. New research says TikTok can track every character its users type any time they use the web browser inside the app. This means if TikTok users type in passwords or credit card numbers while visiting websites through TikTok, that information could be collected by the app. Researchers say while it's common for malware and hacking software to track what users type when visiting other websites, it's unusual for major social media apps to do it. Even though the app has the ability to track that kind of information, it's unclear if it's actively tracking the keystrokes or whether the app is collecting that data. That's what the author of the research told the New York Times. His name is Felix Krauss, a privacy researcher and former Google engineer. TikTok has been embroiled in a number of controversies over its data handling. The app is one of the most popular in the U.S., with an estimated 80 million monthly users in the country. At the same time, its parent company is based in China. Under Chinese law, companies have to hand over user data to the communist regime if officials ask for it. TikTok says it stores American user data in Virginia with backups in Singapore. But a BuzzFeed report says the company's engineers in China had access to U.S. user data last year. Responding to the new research about collecting user keystrokes, TikTok called it incorrect and misleading and said the feature is for debugging, troubleshooting and performance monitoring. On the communications front, another nation is joining the list of countries banning Chinese telecom gear from their 5G networks. With India banning Huawei and ZTE, Huawei's founder says the company's priority now is to survive. Here's what's happening. Telecom companies in India have abandoned China's Huawei and ZTE. In early August, New Delhi-based telecom company Bharti Airtel signed 5G service contracts with Nokia, Ericsson and Samsung. Another India telecom company, Geo Infocom or Geo, is also in talks with Ericsson and Nokia. That's for 5G equipment supplies. Geo already conducted 5G trials with the two companies and plans to offer the service for nine cities by early next year. As of now, the shift leaves no room for Chinese companies in India's 5G rollout. As for 4G, China used to take up to 20% of India's gear market. But not anymore. Huawei and ZTE will be gradually replaced by Ericsson, Nokia and Samsung in Airtel's 4G network. Though Chinese equipment is less expensive, the Indian government and domestic companies are willing to make the change for security reasons, considering 5G's extensive military applications. Alongside the U.S., many of Washington's allies have banned Chinese gear from their 5G networks, including the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Japan. But the change isn't good news for the Chinese companies getting shut out. Huawei's founder says the company is in survival mode. According to an internal email, he said survival is now Huawei's top priority and hinted that employees may see a pay cut. Just ahead, the former mayor of Russia's fourth largest city appeared in court today over charges of discrediting the country's army. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. The Russian-held nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia, Ukraine, had to resort to backup power for the first time. Fire damage caused a cut in the last of four power lines supplying electricity to the plant, reducing its defenses against a meltdown. Here's more. 
Inspectors from the UN nuclear watchdog could arrive at the Russian-held Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine in the coming days, and they say it is urgent that they access and inspect the facility. Highlighting the risks to the plant, the last of four regular power lines supplying the site was briefly cut on Thursday, meaning the plant had to resort to backup power for the first time and thinning its defenses against a potentially catastrophic meltdown. Russia captured the Zaporizhia plant in March, but Ukrainian technicians have kept it operating under the orders of Russian forces. It is the largest nuclear plant in Europe. Russia and Ukraine have accused each other of shelling the site, fueling fears of a nuclear disaster. Ukraine's energy minister said he'd never dreamed any military would risk firing on a nuclear plant. Any games with the nuclear plant will mean that it has to be turned off from our energy system. This means a blackout of the plant, which has huge risks attached to it, a huge risk approaching that of a nuclear war. This is just, I used to think that no one would shell a nuclear station, even during a war. Nuclear experts have warned of the risk of an accident at the plant's spent nuclear fuel pools or its reactors. Cuts in power could prevent the plant from cooling spent fuel, potentially causing a disastrous meltdown. The United Nations is insisting the area around the plant be demilitarized, a subject that came up on a Thursday phone call between U.S. President Joe Biden and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Zelensky said, quote, every minute that Russian troops remain at the nuclear power station, there is a risk risk of global radiation catastrophe. In Russia, a former mayor had his first court hearing over charges of discrediting the country's military. He was arrested yesterday and faces up to three years in prison if convicted. Here's a report from NTD's Eddie Aitken. The former mayor of Russia's fourth largest city, Yekaterinburg, appeared in a court on Thursday on charges of discrediting the country's military. During the hearing, Yevgeny Reutzman said he didn't do anything wrong. On Wednesday, police arrested Droidsman following searches at his apartment and office. He told reporters the case against him had been launched under a new law adopted after Russia sent troops to Ukraine. Hello, how can you comment on all this? In principle, the whole essence of it is because I call the war a war. That's it. Roizman faces up to three years in prison if convicted. Russian courts fined him three times earlier this year on similar charges, paving the way for a criminal case the law authorizes for repeat offenses. Roisman, a sharp critic of the Kremlin, is one of the most visible and charismatic opposition figures in Russia. During his tenure as mayor, between 2013 and 2018, he enjoyed broad popularity in Yekaterinburg, a city of 1.5 million in the Ural Mountains. Shortly after Roisman's arrest, some residents picketed in his support. They shouted, Freedom! Freedom! Eddie Aitken, NTD News. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, the heat wave in Europe is now affecting French wine. Farmers are picking their champagne grapes earlier due to the hot weather, and they may have to change how they make the drink as well. Stay tuned for more after the short break. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The Epoch Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interest, and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit, a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference in all your devices. We'd love to have you on board. I love you!
heritage, virtue, and true tradition. Masters from all disciplines display the essence of their styles at the 7th NTD International Traditional Chinese Martial Arts Competition. On August 28th, the finals will be broadcast live from New York. You can watch online or you can be there in person. Tickets on sale now. For details, visit martialarts.ntdtv.com. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is accompanying NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on a trip to the Canadian Arctic. The visit focuses on defense and climate issues in the country's far north, that amid tensions over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The two leaders addressed the annual Operation Nanook military exercise in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. The region is one of the main stops for vessels crossing the Arctic Ocean's Northwest Passage. Stoltenberg reaffirmed the importance of the Arctic to the NATO alliance. According to the Arctic Council, almost 40 percent of Canada is considered Arctic, while Russia has over half of the Arctic Ocean's coastline. The leaders also toured the Northern Early Warning System radar station at the site. Earlier this week, Trudeau joined German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Toronto and Newfoundland. His visit targeted green energy ties between the two countries. Stoltenberg also made trips to Europe's Arctic this year, showing his support for Finland and Sweden's bid to join NATO. Storing snow over the summer to reuse it in the fall. A ski resort in Germany is attempting to do just that so the winter season can start earlier. A German ski resort, which has hosted several Nordic World Championships, is trying to conserve snow for the upcoming winter season. If the resort can successfully conserve snow over the hot summer months, it can be used in autumn for winter athletes to train before trails are covered with fresh snow. The the stored snow has an almost 20-inch thick isolation layer of wood chips to ensure there's no exchange of air. The chips soak up water when it rains. Once dry weather returns, the humidity vaporizes, which creates a cooling effect for storage. Other countries like Italy and Switzerland have used this method in the past. And over in France, champagne grape pickers were toiling under a blistering sun this week. It's earlier in the season than usual. Hot weather is forcing the farmers to act now, and it's possible this may eventually change how they make the sparkling wine too. Champagne grape pickers have had to start the harvest earlier this year. A hot, dry summer is forcing the makers of the French sparkling wine to rethink how they make the coveted bubbly. High temperatures and the worst drought on record have caused massive wildfires and led to restrictions on water usage across France. But they also boosted grape maturity. An August harvest rather than in early September last year used to be a rare event in Champagne, not anymore. On the steep hillside where the precious Pinot grape grows, pickers hired for the short harvesting season are working in temperatures well above 30 degrees Celsius, that's 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It's important to pick the grapes before they become overripe and supercharged with sugar. What's coming now is uh, possibly overripe grapes, possibly too dry summer seasons uh, that will uh, cause other problems that we will need to adapt to. Frost and mildew fungus attacked ravaged vineyards in 2021. Something dry and hot weather helped prevent this year. Champagne fans will be relieved to hear that producers across France are expecting this year's harvest to yield a good quality vintage when it makes its way to market. And still to come, a Cuban dancer keeps his dream alive after rehabilitating from a rare immune disorder. He's now a first dancer in the Cuban National Ballet. We'll have all that and more for you in just a minute. Becoming a first dancer within a ballet company despite a rare neurological disorder, that's what a dancer in Cuba was able to achieve. And it's been his dream. Let's take a look. Cuban dancer Yankil Vasquez joined the Cuban National Ballet in 2011. Shortly after, he was stricken with Guillain-Barre syndrome, a rare but often debilitating condition in which the immune system attacks the nerves. It left him incapacitated. He then began rehabilitation. First I had to learn how to walk again. That took several months. Then came the more challenging part when I arrived at Cuba's National Ballet. 
The physical preparation was harder and more complicated. I experienced a lot of pain. It was hard because I came with my illness, and they label you as if you are still weak. But thanks to rehabilitation, I was able to carry on and become the first dancer. He returned to the ballet, and this year he became a first dancer, an elite distinction within the ballet. It has been one of his childhood dreams. The director of the National Ballet comments. A dancer is like an athlete. The importance of having physical preparation is essential. Having muscle control, having the capacity to reposition one's body, being fit, exercising one's heart to build physical endurance, these are very important aspects to consider when developing the technique of ballet. A team of physiotherapists arrived recently from Chile to compare notes with their counterparts in Cuba and to help condition Cuban dancers for upcoming performances. We've seen the work done by physiotherapists at the ballet, and we've contacted them to share some techniques that haven't been able to be distributed across the world due to the pandemic. For example, the communication and possibility to attend courses and specialize, and to have the latest knowledge, has always been limited because of technological access. Cuba's National Ballet was founded in 1948 and Havana is among the world's most renowned ballet companies. Moviegoers boarded boats floating on the waters of Venice. They were there for a floating film festival. The festival is called Floating Cinema, Unknown Waters. Moviegoers boarded rowboats, motorboats and gondolas just as the sun was setting. Spectators sailed over to a floating platform where they could sit and watch a film at a good viewing distance from the movie screen. When it got dark, viewers could not only watch the movie, but also enjoy the breathtaking view of Venice. The city is beloved around the world for its canals, historic architecture, and art. It's also known for its famous International Film Festival, which will open its 79th edition on Wednesday. That's an addition to this floating movie festival. Restoration work has begun on a Mayan site in eastern Mexico. Archaeologists from the country's National Institute of Anthropology and History are leading the project. They estimate there were 50 rooms in this housing complex for Mayan rulers. It contains porches, sunken patios, and cooking areas. The temple that the researchers plan to restore is named Building 46. The structure is about 40 feet high, and it was used exclusively by nobility that ruled the region. The area was once one of the largest settlements on the northern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. As its glory days, it stretched over six square miles. A manatee, recovering from distress, was released back into the ocean. The moment was documented by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and SeaWorld. The manatee, named Crumpet, was first found in January by staff members of Florida Power and Light. It was swimming sideways in the warm water outflows of the company's clean energy center. Crumpet was found again two weeks later and was taken to SeaWorld for rehabilitation. He responded very well to treatment, and SeaWorld staff called him a sweet soul. When Crumpet first arrived at SeaWorld, he was underweight. On his return to the wild after seven months of recovery, the mammal reached a healthy weight of 1,500 pounds. Pollution and ship strikes are now the main threats to these creatures. Officials suggest that people along Florida's coast report any sick or distressed manatees they spot so they can be taken to a rehabilitation center. Animals at the London Zoo are getting their annual checkup. For zookeepers, it's not always an easy task. The most challenging part can be getting the animals on their feet to be measured. Camels, squirrel monkeys, and penguins are particularly tricky. Animal keepers have to coax them onto scales for the weigh-in. They discovered the penguins can be lured across the scales while lining up for breakfast. According to the Zoological Society of London, the checkup can assess the general health and growth of the animals. The process also provides clues about pregnancies. And the information will then be shared with zoos around the world to compare statistics. The London Zoo said the only animals that won't be recorded are three endangered tiger cubs that were born just eight weeks ago. Instead, they'll be weighed at their first health check. The liver has an incredible capacity to rebuild itself as long as you don't abuse it too much for too long. Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Here's an interesting and well-known fact about one of your body's most vital organs, the liver. It is known that the liver can repair itself, but just how much can it do? If you've been drinking for years, let's say, 
can your liver just fix itself so it's like you've never touched the stuff? It really depends on the level of damage that's done. There are various stages of alcohol-related liver disease, but the first two, alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis, don't produce many symptoms. Alcoholic fatty liver disease may produce no symptoms at all. This means it can progress easily without notice. If you stop drinking during the first two stages, your liver will likely repair itself. The length of time, however, will depend on the severity of the condition. Healing can begin within days and take a few weeks to a year for the liver to completely recover to its original function. You'll want to eliminate alcohol intake during this time and try to eat as healthily as possible. On the other hand, your liver disease may have progressed to the point of cirrhosis. This is marked by scarring on the liver. In this case, your organ will not be able to repair itself. The scars are permanent and continuing to drink may lead to liver failure and a host of other deadly risks. Because you may not notice any symptoms until the second stage of a liver problem, it's a good idea to take inventory of how much you drink. If you're exceeding one standard size drink per day as a woman or two as a man, your liver is unlikely to be in top form. If you begin to notice discomfort in the abdomen, fatigue, unexplained weight loss, loss of appetite or nausea, it may indicate early stage liver problems. A blood test and ultrasound can help determine the overall health of your liver. So in short, your liver can repair itself up to a point. To maintain liver health, consume a low to moderate amount of alcohol and keep up with doctor's appointments. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.